president or CEO for uh, um, CEI, Coastal Enterprise. Mm -hmm. Wow, good luck. Yeah, so it's good news that things, you know, yeah, things, things are, are hiring, yeah. things are going. Yeah. It's good. Oh, my mic. Okay. There we go. Okay. So we got that. We got this. Are we on? Yeah, we're on. Okay. Um, sorry for the delay there for a second. Um, I just want to welcome everyone to the Scarborough Town Council's Finance Committee. Today is Wednesday, October 14th. We are in Council Chambers A. It's about 4 o'clock. Uh, to begin the meeting, uh, we'll do the call to order, of course. Um, just for the record, we do have all members of the committee present. We do also have uh, the town manager, Tom Hall, and I do see in the audience a couple of people, including Councilor Katarina, so, uh, as well as uh, other staff members that are walking in. So thank you, everyone, for coming. Uh, with that, um, is there a motion to approve the minutes of August 18th, 2015? So moved. Jacob. Any adjustments, amendments, or anything to note? Mm -hmm. Everyone's happy? All in favor? Aye. Hey. It was three to zero. Thank you very much. Uh, today's uh, meeting is um, just to kind of... Uh, encapsulate uh, what we're going to talk about but then also some direction this is really the last meeting of the Scarborough Town Council for this current uh, cycle um, our next uh, meeting probably will not occur until um, after the election and after a new council chair is selected as well as new officers um, that are chairs of each of the committees um, I, I want to begin before we at least finish up with the final businesses just really to say thank you to the my colleagues for the work that we've done um, over the past year. I wish it was a little bit more fruitful, but then in the end, when I think about it, we've actually had a very good year, and I'm very happy with that. And uh, that will hopefully conclude with the four items, yeah, three items that we're going to discuss today. Uh, one is more routine. Um, and uh, so with that, I just want to kind of turn it over now to uh, Tom and Ruth, our finance director, who's joined us on the discussion and review of the financial statements for the year end September 30th as presented in an internal format. Right. Yeah, we did provide uh, the standard format that uh, we've been doing for the last several years, just so they're there for you. But I know Gina Klerke and, and Ruth collaborated on coming up with kind of a new view, uh, and we're interested in sharing that with you and getting some feedback if we're inching toward uh, the sort of reporting that would be helpful. Uh, so with that, Ruth, do you want to talk about it? What, I might suggest we focus on the new format. Um, okay. uh, the balance sheet, which is the... The newer format mm -hmm. is um, really it's a comparison of prior year with the most recent completed month of September, which I believe the Finance Committee had asked for. Uh, so you can kind of see where things are. The September 30th, 2014 are audited numbers. I'm sorry, which, which numbers are audited? The uh, 14, 2014 okay, yep. numbers, yeah. That's yeah, right. Yep. Is that, in fact, helpful to have a year over year kind of September to from kind one year to the next? Okay. I yeah. think this is, um, or whatever reporting period that we have. So it's not, so it's the same period. So if we're doing a June assessment, then showing where we are in June of the prior year. Correct. Yeah. Um, yeah. Comparison. Yeah. Uh, is a comparative purpose, yeah. Just a quick question. Why? why so what, what's really helpful then is to, if you look down throughout the accounts payable really spiked. I mean, it's much greater this September than last September. What what was in payables that would cause that? Um, one of the things is the county tax. We've posted it. We have not paid it. We don't pay it until after tomorrow, actually. But it wouldn't have been in last year's? You didn't do this Last until year like we held it until. So we're trying to stop holding invoices. We're trying to actually post them yep. if not pay them. We won't pay it until the last week of October. And mm -hmm. then they'll assess an interest penalty if we don't. The county yeah. tax is 2.493 million this year. So it's a, it's a big chunk of change. Yeah. <coughs> um, so uh, the next two are one is the expenditures and one is the revenues. 
I think we still presented the old format, but the second and third pages here show a year-by-year -year comparison as well. And uh, I wasn't 100 percent sure what would be good to you, so we just did appropriations versus expended. So it, it might not include encumbrances. The revenues are pretty much the uh, revised. So if there were any budget adjustments, it's the final revenue number and then the actual for those two years for September this year, September last year. Oh, okay. Well, that's where you see that. So is there anything we should be aware of that jumps out at you? But you can see that's where the county tax is. Mm -hmm. That's correct. Which is what's causing the, the spike. Anything <laughs> else that notable? That you want to draw our attention to? Okay. So I, I do have a couple of questions on the notable piece, if you don't mind. Mm -hmm. uh, the first one is um, going down the line. Significant difference in expenditure is the executive. Is that the county piece? Is that where that is? No, county is like the third or fourth from the bottom under the general town section, not the school. Okay. It's oh, I'm sorry. Yes, yeah, there it is right there. So yeah. on line 56 or the one 1100 account, account 56, there's a, about a 150, 200, almost $200,000 gap between last year and this year. What drives that executive piece? Um, I think this year we've allocated um, many of the contractual obligations that we didn't do in the prior <clears throat> year. Uh, I don't think that got done until actually prior to the end of the year, mid March, April ish. Okay. So since there is a change in management um, format, will we expect to see the consistency of that change next year? I think so. Okay. It will depend on whether, you know, if the union contracts don't get finalized by June kind of thing, then it can then change it. Might it. Get okay. Held out. Yeah. That's, um, that explains my other questions really because they're kind of consistent with that question. I have, is there any other questions? So this new for, format, uh, Ruth, uh, it shows we're dealing with the first quarter of the fiscal year. Yes. July 1 to September 30. <clears throat> and what we're doing is showing what was spent in the first quarter of the prior year's first Correct. quarter. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. So just sort of an apples to apples. Hopefully it's an apples to apples comparison. Yes. Yeah. Okay. The other mm -hmm. outlier is capital equipment, yeah, and, so. and that's not a surprising one. Yeah. Those are high value items, and it's just a matter of timing. Uh, so uh, of all of these, that's probably the hardest one to look apples to apples because there can just be some wild variations year to year. You know, so, so suggestions for, so part of the, this question was for suggestions for changes or format. Mm -hmm. What might be helpful would be maybe then just highlighting on here anything that's sort of out of norm. So as, we, so as, as you present it, then you can just speak to it as you kind of go down through it. So anything that just, so rather than us kind of keep peppering you with things, mm -hmm. um, anything that, you know, looks like it should be just kind of highlighted, that'd be really helpful to just kind of highlight mm -hmm. it and then we'll see it and you can just kind of speak to it as you go down through okay. it. Okay. Yep. That sounds good. And, um, one way I've seen that done in other organizations is to have a footnote section and then just footnote, uh, you know, you know, if it's payables, then the footnote would be number one, and then you can then immediately go to the bottom and it answers See the question. Before. Yeah, you know, that's kind of an easy way to con idea. manage that. Yep. Good suggestion. Yeah, so your review could be much quicker, and we could focus yeah. on a handful of questions rather than, as you say, line by line peppering us questions. Yep. So we'll just assume everything else is, you know, kind of normal, and you're just going to highlight for us things that, that are a little out of, whether it's a timing issue or mm -hmm. whatever. Yes. Change in practice or something. And then the last page is the revenue page. Yep. Same thing. So the the remaining two financial statements are representative of what? Oh, these are the. Kind of, uh, these old are the traditional form. ones. Old oh, the old format. format. Okay. Right. All right. But I did include the same detail for the yeah, yeah, 14 yeah. also. I mean, personally, I'd be happy with just the first, first document. Three pages. Yeah, I can do um, it. I think that summarizes it, I think, very nicely. 
um, and I'm happy with. I mean, the purpose of, at least for myself, as far as recommending kind of changing the format is to then use this to then dictate maybe some um, trend analysis that we can have regarding the balance sheet, but also the income statement or the expense sheet. Um, and so I was kind of hoping that, I, I know that we talked about this as part of the RFP, is that maybe getting recommendations from the accountant, because they have industry resources that suggest, you know, here are some ratios that can be looked at. You know, is in a municipality current ratio, liquidity, capital, you know, what are the appropriate ratios that we can look at and then trend over time so that we kind of look at the bigger picture and not get into the line item. I wasn't sure if you wanted, how often you wanted the ratios. I mean, I could present them each time. Um, well, I personally, um, I would think that they become useful only at annual and for a municipality because of the seasonality of expenses, it would be semi-annual and annual would seem to me to be an appropriate tool. I would hope that would be consistent with whoever the next chair of the committee is. Okay. You know, one other piece incorporating the old format. Um, you know, I noticed down here on the bottom, you do have, you know, a note saying, okay, it's three months, it should be 25% of revenue and or expenditures. Yeah. Mm -hmm. On the old format, though, you actually have a sort of the total, you know, total where we are. So in this case, in 2015, September, our total general fund, we're actually at 32% of percent used. So I don't know if that would be just an appropriate Oh, I got gotcha. you. Yeah, I was wondering about the percentages. I was trying to figure yeah. out which which way to compare yeah. year to year, or. But just maybe as footnote saying, you know, we would be expected to be at twenty five percent. And we're at thirty two. to be at thirty two point yep. five. That's because the county tax was in the in the numbers, and it wasn't last year. Just 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 that little piece of benchmark without all the detail. Mm -hmm. but we can quickly look and say, yeah, we seem to be on track. Or boy, you know, yeah. we're not. Yeah. And I think the use of the footnote process would actually help that too, because then you can use that as one of the opening statements, general, a general statement for this. Absolutely. I think the footnote uh, yeah. it's gonna very help. much helps us. You know, you so look at it, and if you're just getting it now, yeah. just looking at it, I'm going, boy, it's just. Yeah. It's a lot of information. It's a lot of information. No, it makes sense. We'll flag the things that yeah. we, we think you, have to, you yeah. know, might have to anticipate your questions and answer them before you have to ask them. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Um, good. Yeah, so the only thing, so since I brought it up regarding the trends, and I know that we talked about it, um, keep in mind that if we do move to being able to provide that executive level kind of analysis so that we're looking at the big picture and kind of a long term, um, there's, going to be a, there's going to be a need for a learning curve and some training in the sense so people can understand what is current ratio um, or what is a capital debt ratio what is you know so um, something just to consider as part of how we do that because while some of us who are in the business world might understand what they are not everyone understands just as much as I don't understand ordinance sometimes some people don't understand finance yeah sure that's true right so or want to <laughs> want to exactly <laughs> yeah. exactly so um, so with that um, what I would like to actually recommend if it's okay um, maybe I don't know if it needs to be a formal action is that I would actually like to recommend that the Finance Committee forward to the Town Council for their information purposes as part of the uh, finance update is the uh, first packet mm -hmm. of information which is the new format of the balance sheet and the income state or the expense sheet and we'll include that in our finance report if that's okay with you too sure okay. yeah particularly uh, if you wanted to um, elaborate a little bit yeah. uh, in the report not just a a really abbreviated, but uh, a little bit more of an explanation. Absolutely. Councilor Mayvine, is that something you would present uh, as part of your committee reports? That I would like to. Yeah. We'll have copies Absolutely. available for you. And we'll talk because, mm -hmm. yeah. Good. Yeah, that's we'll talk. Good, good idea. idea. But I think that's a good idea. Uh, moving then on to uh, item number six, um, approve recommended allocations to outside agencies. And um, I'm going to turn this over yes. to Tom, and then maybe yeah, Council Donovan. I was with, prov uh, with providing a recommendation for your consideration for the 2016 request to really dispense with them. Rules and Policies continues to work on um, kind of a new policy going forward. Uh, and I'll certainly let Council Donovan update, but we, we did get some insightful information based on two-on-one calling. That's uh, Scarborough residents calling for assistance, just so we can get a sense of where is the need. I think that information is going to greatly inform that conversation. Um, but 
we do need to dispense with the ones that are in front of us. And the proposal I have for you today, and I apologize, I should have provided a bit of a narrative, but essentially the methodology I chose, I, I first of all, uh, red circle project race. I will admit my affinity to that group. I've been yeah. consistent in that regard. Um, at the 2015 level, and then what we did is we basically looked at what was left for 2016 requests against the available budget and came up with a proration. So uh, Ruth calculated uh, it's 75.06 percent of the requested amounts, and we were we calculated that. The other caveat: um, in no case did the amount. In my recommendation, does the amount um, exceed the 2015 appropriation? And what you'll note is that there's actually money left over by this approach. There's $8,140, which I don't think is a bad thing. You don't need to spend it. And I might suggest uh, you, could, you could decide if you want to allocate that differently, obviously, or hold it in um, to see if the need arises. And the mm -hmm. need I can anticipate is probably fuel assistance and we'll know mm -hmm. more as the season progresses in terms of weather and and price and all of those factors. Uh, but I can honestly say the need is always outpaced uh, the available funds. Uh, you don't need to make that decision today. So that's my recommendation to you. The, the far right hand column would be the amounts uh, and, the, and of course to those uh, beneficiaries. Thank you. Um, so uh, the question I have to start, if you don't mind, um, is how are those, um, the Rules and Policies Committee, I believe, if I have the right committee, was charged with coming up with criteria and standards. Mm -hmm. What are the new standards and criteria for this recommendation that are being Well, used? they aren't in place, and so it's really <laughs> left to me to, to come to, and I've just provided the rationale. So the committee is still in process, and Councilor mm -hmm. Donovan and Councilor Hayes are part of that process. They can certainly comment. I think they are inching closer to coming up with a whole new um, set of guidelines, if you will. But since the, all of these requests are in hand and many of these agencies are calling by the week looking for what the final decision was, they saw it best to um, move these, these requests uh, in advance of their new policy. Okay. Um, can you identify, at least uh, for, my, for myself, um, out of the... I don't know, is it 20 requests? I can't do the math quick enough, but out of all the requests, I identify at least five that are Scarborough-based. Um, I'm looking at Southern Maine Agency on Aging, Regional Transportation, Hospice of Southern Maine, Project Grace, and Project Grace Fuel Assistance, although that's really the same one as above. Are there others that, are in, uh, although Regional Transportation really isn't Scarborough-based, but it's got services in Scarborough. The other ones, are they home to, in Scarborough? Are any of them homed in Scarborough? Yeah, I, I, I don't believe so, but many of the ones you name, though they may be homed here, they're affiliated with much larger organizations. Are they? Okay. Um, yeah, Hospice of Southern Maine is part of the Maine Health. Health. And, and oh, those are exactly the sort of conversations rules and policies is having in terms of how do you divvy up the pie. Yeah, let me just yes. uh, uh, chime in with where um, the Rules and Policy Committee review was we asked that uh, the 211 data uh, be provided and has been provided by uh, the United Way representative. And it was specific to Scarborough, right? Yes. Uh, and it was specific to Scarborough. And, uh, and it demonstrates that the, the big three, shelter, food, and health care, including right. mental health care, yep. are, are, are the ones that just dominate whether it's that order each year, no, it varied some, but those three essentials of life were the ones that, uh, that dominated. And that, of course, has been, always been a part of the application form mm -hmm. that, that all of these applicants were addressing to demonstrate that they were actually meeting uh, needs in that, in those arenas. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think we all felt at Rules and Policy that a um, recommendation by uh, the general, uh, by the town manager, based on uh, mm -hmm. his assessment of the applications meeting the standards that were set forth in the application form, would be an appropriate way. And uh, a pro, pro rata sharing seemed to be one that was uh, favored when suggested by the town manager by the uh, the members of the rules committee. 
So that's how we got to where we are, which I think is probably a good outcome. And I would say, as to the excess, uh, uh, having it there for an extraordinary circumstance that might arise in, in the way of need would be a very valuable thing to, to meet uh, some person's uh, unfortunate circumstance that may develop this winter. Yeah, especially with the results from Project Hope today. I mean, there's who would have thought there'd be that kind of activity with, mm -hmm. with our community? And they're, they're that using may be resources. a very worthy, I'm not sure where, how that happens and right. to what agencies that money goes, but in support of a program like that, again, it's not bad to have that for another day. Um, right. And Sean, I think I'll, I'll, I'll tag team on to Bill. One of the things we did talk about too, and we actually asked the United, we actually asked someone that does United Way allocations to come and share sort of their thoughts and practices yep. and what they, what they did. And we started to ask that question about trying to do a better job at identifying what the needs are and then also do a better job of trying to keep all those dollars to entities that are here in Scarborough. So the dollars actually stay within our, our community and not necessarily going. A lot of these that are on this list, as we've talked about, are part of Mercy Hospital, which is now part of Eastern Maine Medical Center and part of Maine Medical Center and others, so. Absolutely. I, I had one question on, on Tom, on did the home health Visiting nurses of Southern Maine give any explanation of why they their I mean their their request almost doubled. Was there was there a compelling reason for that? I or? don't recall as such. No, okay. I mean uh, they completed the application <laughs> along with everyone else. Uh, as part of that, you may recall we asked for them to provide Scarborough specific yeah, services yeah. they provided yeah. in the past year. I don't recall any compelling reason why there was such a jump in. Okay. I guess I look back to Colette. She's shaking her head no. Because everything, all the others were sort of in line. That was just a pretty dramatic request Agreed. change. I could look back at the application, but nothing it's almost doubled comes back oh. to memory. Mm -hmm. okay. Again, that, that's one that the committee's kicked around. That that one of all is probably associated. Well, I guess is is that part of Maine Health? Um, home home health visiting, visiting nurses. nurses. It's it's part of one of the systems. I get confused, which is which is it, sort of. It's plugged into a, a much larger Gotta be. No, organization, yes. a multi-million dollar organization yes. for sure. Uh, so um, so I, I'm happy with approving the recommendation that's been forward because I do appreciate the work that's been done. I will say that, at least personally, is my hope is that um, that consideration regarding the appropriation, the consideration is that maybe the town consider a longer range kind of commitment rather than just a year to year basis. So if, uh, for example, Project Grace is one of our preferred um, allocations, then we make a commitment over a three-year period. Um, that way, we're, we know, I mean, we're talking about how do we pre-plan future year's obligations. This is kind of a way to step into that. Um, I just think that 20 organizations is a little bit much. I'd rather concentrate on four or five core issues mm -hmm. that support the community um, and give them larger portions and do that commitment over a three-year period and then go through the evaluation process maybe at the end of a three-year period. So um, something for maybe us to consider as the rule comes forward. Um, I just think that this is a lot, and I'll be honest, I mean, a couple of these that are $225, 670 670 seems to me that um, I would rather give one organization $1,800. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, it's, a, it's a meaningful contribution when it's at that level mm -hmm. rather than 225 for Reese across America, which is a great organization. I'm not depicting that, but, or uh, degrading that, but um, I just think it could be better served. Yeah, I, my expectation is with this new policy and focus, uh, this, this, the number of eligible applications will, will be reduced. If yeah. we identify three or four targeted areas, if you mm -hmm. will, mm -hmm. and if the agency doesn't provide services in any one of those uh, preferred agencies, then we don't consider it. So I, I expect this list will be winnowed down maybe by half next year. Yeah, yeah I think it, uh, all members of the Rules Committee felt that uh, uh, a material contribution to the Scarborough community was kind of uh, so that we, we were more Scarborough-centric. Yeah. I mean, I don't disagree with, you know, shelter, health care, food, Right. You know, those are those are obviously critical issues that every you know families do struggle with. It's just um, there's just sometimes too much need out there. 
with such little money. So, mm, yeah. but I like the, I like how you've gone about that, and I'll support the the recommendation of the fifty one thousand eight sixty to the ones that have been outlined. Do we need to move? We would because I think we need to. Yep. Although, um, can you refresh my memory? Weren't we charged with actually making that decision? Yes. It does not. We can use it as a point of information I back think to the report council. Report back to council. Yeah. It does not go back to them. No. So you need a motion yes, to uh, approve the recommendation yep. of the town manager, and also move. Great. Okay. Excellent. Any other comments about it? Mm. No. All in favor? Aye. It's three to zero. Um, can I? Because I've written all over mine. For um, can I get a fresh copy of this document? Um, and if you want to take out the prorated approval piece, because yep. um, I don't think that's really, you can have that. Yeah. I don't, uh, that way I can just hand, we can, that can be part of it. I'll Thank provide you. you maybe with a footnote that provides a little more detail for the rationale for uh, the yeah. recommendation, just so you can get those questions. But if you can also put on there a footnote that the Rules and Policy Committee will be submitting their yep. policy at a later date, mm -hmm. that'd be nice too. Um, the next item is the cap um, um, discussion and approval of the capital budget policy uh, that we received on October 9th in draft format. Yeah, um, I'm going to turn that over to Tom. I didn't want to be presumptuous. I did put on possible action. I, um, we've got this to the point that from a staff's perspective, we think it's certainly a good first start. Um, and I did circulate it to my senior staff. Uh, they really had no substantive uh, input, no changes I'd bring to you. Uh, so from our perspective, it's ready for, for consideration. It's certainly better to have something in place that we can build upon um, as the need arises. What sort of action uh, is required um, to adopt the policy? So there were some blanks. To yeah, there are a couple of blanks. Um, well, as to adoption, I believe it first starts with this committee, and then we do have the council consider and adopt the formal policy just to give it yeah. more yeah. great, uh, more weight. We vote to recommend approval. Yes. Uh, yes. That's so one of the items is on page two, the capital improvement project and capital equipment, and it kind of talks <laughs> to, under definitions, what, what it means and... Um, have a multi-year life with estimated costs in excess of X, and that's what we would uh, consider to be a capital item as opposed to just, you know, general mm -hmm. maintenance. And I, I wasn't 100% sure what numbers should be there. I know what I would put, but... What would you... That's <laughs> I, actually my first question. I would put high numbers there, so... That's, but I know it's... it's so define high. <laughs> anything over 100000 Okay. Um, so I have a question related to that, um, whether it's 100,000, 50,000, or a million. The question I have is in the, in the language around estimated costs in both um, the first um, capital improvements project question and then the capital equipment. So when we talk about these type of improvements, is that on an estimated cost on an annual basis? Is it as estimated cost over the life of the project? Um, what are we discussing when we're talking about the estimated costs? The initial costs. This policy goes on to encourage us to understand what life cycle costs are just as a point of information, but in this context, it's the initial mm -hmm. um, entry, the initial cost of the item. Capital acquisition. So the, the reason why I asked that, because I kind of I saw and assumed that it's like in the capital improvements projects, it does state, and now I'm not going to read the whole thing, um, the second part of the, that are consumed within a year, but rather have a multi-life with estimated costs. So is it the estimated cost within the multi-life or within that one year? Usually a capital improvement is considered a multi-year project. Okay. So it's gonna go across the years. Um, so in, in, in that respect, the capital equipment one is usually you buy it this year, you're done because it's smaller items. Um, I don't like the term capital equipment because it tends to mean equipment, but usually it could be capital something fixing a park that's less than a hundred thousand or just over a hundred thousand or something you know but it's not equipment so we tend to put it under capital projects but it's still only going to be done within a year so to me capital projects should be the the big ticket items you know a new public safety building new library fixing a major road that's been damaged or whatever absolutely so uh, would it be hoove us to have an additional definition that defines that estimated cost within the the boundaries of what we just discussed so that it's clear. I mean, because one—I mean, um, not to give credibility to the argument that I've heard over years, but you know, there's always been that argument of, um, you know, we're trying to um, rig the system, 
And we're proposing the, uh, the project this year at X dollars, which is below the threshold, when the actual cost of the whole project is greater than X over the lifetime. And we're trying to avoid having to go to the voters. Um, I've heard that you know, with the municipal park. I've heard it with other referendum things that we've done in town, no matter what it is. I, I would like to have this policy be clear that it is about the initial costs that are on the outlay so that we can reference that back so that people so can understand. Would it be clear if we just switch things? So for under, it would read a major non-recurring capital expenditure in excess of whatever that number is. And then at the end of it is multi-year life period. Does that add to it does because like the word non-recurring defines that for me. Non-recurring means it's one year. It has to be one year. The uh, capital equipment uh, sentence doesn't make reference to uh, multi-year life. Like a, a capital equipment, uh, like a pencil, doesn't have a multi-year life. I can see why you'd say the dollar amount should be at a certain level, because now you're scooping up small items, right. pad of paper. But it's, it, it's. Yeah, the, the dollar figure may be lesser for the capital equipment, but it still ought to be sizable. 10,000, 25, I, I don't know what that number is necessarily, but to avoid the point you, you mentioned. Well, I, I think what, you, yeah, you're trying to use both the dollars and the reference to a, a multi-year life. Well, the capital equipment doesn't have to be multi-year. We can do that within, most of the time, within a year. Usually we buy a, like a plow truck. We usually do it within a year, so it's not a, um, it's not recurring, if you will, except for the fact that we buy one every year. I think but when you're referring to that time frame, you're talking about the time between budget approval, bidding, receiving. and actually paying for it. We may span a couple of fiscal years. I'm not sure if that I, is I mean, relevant. Because I, I thought this was all about what do we capitalize, what do we expense? Right, and and, and so yeah, right. So uh, if if you're you're going to expense everything that would be used up in the course of a year. That's a fundamental. And, and so a capital asset is a, a, an asset that has a multi-year life to it. Well, to some degree, but sometimes you don't want, if we only need to buy something like a, a loader once, once and it's going to mm -hmm. cost $400,000, we can spike the public works budget this year and then next, you know, 10 years it's nothing. And then, you know, 10 years down the road we spike another 400000 I think putting it here tends to eat, level it out a little bit. Oh, absolutely. Even though it may only be done in, you know, a one-year time frame. You know, there's some gray areas, though. Uh, police cruisers, we buy four a year. We have been able, over time, to migrate those from capital. Those are actually in the operating budget. See, that circumstance makes sense. We haven't been able to do that. Because it's all, a recurring all, all cost. All. Right. We buy at least one plow truck a year. And we should be putting that in, in operating. And, and that's the other piece is to get it out of you know, some of the recurring little guys, like like the school department, I think they do something with their floors every year that's under capital. To me, that's a recurring that should be in their operating. But, you know, the world according to Ruth, I guess, you know. So um, it's, it's, it's those kinds of things. But, but I, I guess I'm confused now, kind of getting to Sean's question and a little bit to getting to our charter about what actually has to go to the voters for approval. Um, you know, I think we're trying to set up for the big ticket items that it actually has to go to voter referendum. So if we, so I, I'm not sure how these all jive together because I had a question on that because the dollar amount for the charter is different than these numbers. And so when we get there to have that conversation too, but I wanted to get to Sean's question. If we are going to do a project, what should be capitalized is, is the cost of the whole project and not, you know, parsing it out to 100000 this year. hundred. If, if we know it's all part of the project, mm -hmm. then that needs to be in capital. And so I don't know how we put words in to get at that. Mm -hmm. um, something about the total cost of non-reoccurring total expenditure for the project. Something along those lines. We make it clear that... So based on, yeah, so to that point, based on definition number four, capital improvements projects using that scenario if we were to insert the hundred thousand that's being over here if if a project lasts four years at twenty five thousand dollars a year sorry thirty thousand dollars a year it seems to me that based on what Peter just explained in my head based on this policy we should actually 
be discussing it at the finance committee level as part of the capital budget yes. policy because the total of the project is greater than a hundred thousand. Oh, well then I would increase Do you that see what to I'm a saying? lot more. <laughs> well, that's, well, that's why I was getting at it because I think that the definition of what's too high and what's too low, right. um, no pun intended given the past year is extremely important. So, um, that's why I wanted to, and so back to the question around the, um, the charter, I do think um, that there needs to be an exclusionary clause um, or some type of um, bridge, I guess, to the charter that suggests and says, um, in no way will this policy, um, I can't think of the right word, this policy interfere will with the charter yeah. requirements. Supersede. supersede. Charter, charter supersedes this. Yeah, the charter will always supersede this based upon the definitions that have been defined by the charter as well as the legal opinions that we've had. So that needs to be outside of the definitions, but I, I do agree with Peter. That's why I was asking about, you know, the non-reoccurring versus reoccurring. Because I agree with you, if you're going to change the floors every year, that's an operating expense. You should be able to come to the, and, you know, They've done that in the past in different er issues. It's just sometimes easier to finance. Um, my goal isn't to change the school department because the school department is outside the purview of this at this point, but I hope that this becomes the example that we can then share with them and say, this is something you should consider so that, we're all, yeah, so that we're all on the same page and we work together kind of with the same policies. So the question I have, I guess, um, sorry for talking too much. Um, everything that's been said how do we do that in here we uh, first about the reoccurring piece and then setting the threshold and then the exclusions that we talked about of the bridge well I think uh, it doesn't hurt to state it again but the Charter rules supreme I mean it, okay. it, it takes precedent regardless of whatever policy you have the Charter voted on by the voters uh, is the rule of the land it's the most important legislative document this town has uh, we can state it to make sure it's absolutely clear in that regard. In fact, we do include the relevant section of the charter here uh, as part of this policy. So mm -hmm. it's, it's part of this document. Um, it, it's organized, though, under a section called financing options because these are voter approved. That's the distinction. Um, maybe the way around your concern, Sean, is to insert the word total. I think Peter mentioned it. So it would read, for capital improvement project, a major non-occurring total expenditure in excess of $100,000. So that kind of speaks to the shenanigans of parceling it out over a series of years for purposes of you know, evading this requirement. Um, I think that that would add some clarity in that regard. And this is really an indication for us when we put our budgets together, we have a separate capital budget and an operating budget. Which, which budget do, do we show these in? Mm -hmm. And we've admitted for years now that there's many things in the capital budget that we would like to migrate over to operating. Mm -hmm. When you make that transition, it's a big hit. Uh, but then once you kind of self-correct and you get it built in structurally into the operating budget, it's fairly easy. The, the, the uh, peaks and valleys are smoothed right. out because there's not great change, but that initial year of transition can be painful. Mm -hmm. And the school experience is the same thing. Especially if we're bud bonding some of these items that really should be capital, I mean, should be operating. Yeah. So that now we're just sticking them in the operating budget, they're not, they're going to be funded probably through property taxes. So that, yeah. you know, that becomes a. a yeah, and I will say actually, um, I forgot about the last page. I'm okay on the exclusion clause because I forgot that there was that reference. I was looking for a different word, but I'm okay with the way it's presented. I mean, I would word it maybe differently, but that's perfectly fine. And that's on page four mm -hmm. under financing options for capital budgets. It references the town charter and the and the obligation to, for us to adhere to that. So I'm, I'm perfectly fine with that. And I do like the um, inclusion of the non-reoccurring total expenditure. To me, that covers the question for me is what is the appropriate level? Um, personally, um, and I've said this with the charter question about the 400,000, given the size of our organization or our community, I think $400,000 is extremely low, um, given the cr growing capacity. Um, I think, and I know that the charter commission has talked about it in the past and it's almost been, uh, their recommendation while still was 400,000, there's been some strong, um, discussion around increasing that and it's failed a couple of times uh, by very small margins. I'm one of those that support increasing it at the charter level, but 
you know, I don't think the council needs to be micromanaging expenses below $100,000. I, I agree. I think that needs to be a little bit more uh, more reasonable given the size of a $73 million, um, yeah, $73 million budget total for the town. Whether that's $200,000, $250,000, you know, I would, you know, like to hear maybe how you guys feel about what that number should be. Hmm. Let me give you a scenario that is real life, you know, when the code office needs to replace one of their vehicles. It's a... Twenty thousand, twenty-five thousand dollar expense. We'll say um, that can have dramatic effect on their budget because it's a big spike. Mm -hmm. and, but it doesn't happen every year. We can predict it will happen every four to five years or something like that. Traditionally, those purchases have gone in capital. If we use a hundred, for instance, uh, that would then be um, shown as an expense in their operating budget. Um, you know, and it'll be there waving a big flag. You'll see it. It'll jump right off the page. Um, I don't think there's a right or wrong way necessarily. Do you fund it with tax dollars or do you, or do you fund it with some sort of financing, whether it's uh, short term or long term? The other way to, to, that we've, I think, been effective with in our capital budget, uh, let me take a step back. In the operating budget, typically it's all appropriations from non revenue, non property tax, and property tax sources that fund the operating budget. Capital budget, uh, there's as many as five different funding sources that come to play. Mm -hmm. Long-term bonding, short-term financing, reserve accounts, grant monies, and appropriations. Some of the very small amounts, you might recall, are actually appropriated tax dollars. But they're anomalies. They're kind of, um, they're carved out of the operating budget. So there's good comparative data. So uh, I'm not sure if the way we... In fact, I think the way we do it is probably the best, is that you isolate your operating so you can really have good year-to-year -year comparative. Uh, but in capital, be smart about how you finance it, that it's not all long-term borrowing because many of the items pale. You know, they don't meet the requirements for long-term financing. Does that make any sense? It does. Yeah, it does. And I, I guess what I sort of know, when I, I mean, my experience has been in the corporate world and sort of in the corporate world, you know, the kind of the rule of thumb is the first part of the definition. If you're buying something that has a useful life of more than a year, by IRS standards and other things, you're not allowed to expense that. You need to put it into capital and depreciate it and write it off over time, which is a way to, to even out mm -hmm. the, the, the expense over the life of the assets that you're financing. If that was our intent, then, you know, buying police cruisers and putting them in, you know, so I mean, it sounds like municipal is different than corporate, but I'd be kind of in a place of going back to the overarching definition. If the asset's going to last more than a year, so it's not pencils, right. but it's a vehicle. And some of these vehicles, I know we've been running five or six years. Yep. Um, that seems to me that that our policy should contemplate that that should be a capital item. And, and what I hear you saying that we can choose to finance that capital item through appropriations and other things. It doesn't mean we have to go out and finance it. Is that? You can. It has an effect on the tax rate. Right. Um, well, either way, it has an effect. Well, if you yeah, have, but it's, it's, a, it's a blended effect on the tax if, rate. Um, if you have short-term uh, short borrowing, uh, then, I mean, that would be, say, three. if you had a three-year bond, Mm -hmm. it, it has a third, a third, a third uh, impact on the tax rate. If you have a lease arrangement, it's your... Yeah, it's spread out over time. But th there, is, there is an effect. It's, it's shown itself in debt service uh, appropriation as opposed to... In, in, am I right from a constituency point of view and transparency point of view? If it's in... Well, I guess it depends where we go. Um, for the school budget, anyway, the school budget is approved by the voters. So every everything in operational expense is approved by the voters, but anything in capital is approved by council. the council. And is that a consideration we need to think about? Um, I don't know. So it, get, it gets pretty complicated pretty quickly. Um, yep. but, well, I, I personally, I would say yes because as a department of the town. We can employ this policy on that part of the budget. 
and we can say that we will, based on our policy standards, X, Y, and Z within the capital budget of the school department does not meet our policy and therefore must be taken out. If they wish to then submit it to back to us as part of their overall operating budget, then that's their decision to do that. And then we deal with it from an overall um, total assessment or mm -hmm. an overall um, expenditure mm -hmm. basis rather than on the individual project. Yeah, there's certainly... Nothing says we can't take the capital project apart, right? It's my understanding because it's something we approve right. and doesn't go to referendum. The, so. the, the nuance is the state law that requires voter validation of the school budget is specific to operating only. It does right. not include, by capital. function of that statute, operating. I mean, capital. Capital. Um, that's not their fault. That's just the way the law was right, written. Right, right, right. No, 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 no. I, don't, yeah, yeah. no, I realize that, but just trying to... Some yeah. dis uh, I will be honest, there probably are a few that I can think of off the top of my head that will disagree with that notion that we have a right to change it. <laughs> but I, I think that we do, based on what I'm hearing legislatively with the law plus our own policy, because they are a department of the town. Yeah, to the credit, you might recall in the laptop discussion, there's there was a portion of those expenses that will be that they'll see this fiscal year yep. to, um, that were included in the operating budget, the staff costs. And well, there they some, should be, because they're, they're... Right, and there were some ancillary uh, cable, I don't know what right. they were, but, yeah. you know, they ended up being fairly big numbers, but they're made up of a lot of little parts. Right. Uh, so part was capital financed and shown itself in right. the capital budget. The other stuff was in operating. Uh, so I, I know there's a recognition um, <coughs> of our colleagues at the school side of of really getting as many things over into the operating budget as we can. It's just a matter of how quickly we can do that without spiking the tax rate. And then within the new uh, budget format, you know, we, we have various categories that we've kind of grouped together, mm -hmm. and uh, we could always add a final category that uh, that says, I think we call it now new equipment or something, but we could change it to capital. So anything that's kind of, you know, a major item that's going to be recurring every year, like the plow trucks, we buy one every year, We've been buying them every year, but they're in our capital budget. They're probably bonded because they're pretty significant dollar amounts. School buses is another one. School buses. Um, yeah. They're, they're in capital, right? Not they're capital. Well, they, they, they were operational. They were operating in, in a tough budget year. They have switched to capital, and that's where they sit. And, but by right, they probably ought to be moved back to operating. So we do it every year. Somewhere, I don't know if we saw it here, but at some point, we probably should try to get consistent between how we treat school buses, how we treat plow trucks, how we treat mm. all of these things. I'm not sure what the right answer is, yeah. but I, d I don't know if that's within the scope of this policy that we need to think about. But well, it seems like we should have two different accounting practices for those types of things. I think it would take a multi-year process. If a, if a plow truck or a school bus is between two and four hundred thousand dollars, probably over a three-year period, we put we, we recognize and we put, you know, 50000 this year, 50000 next year. We're going to take out of capital and put towards operating or whatever so that over a four-year period, those buses are now in operating. Those school, uh, the, the plow trucks are now in operating and out of. So some of it gets funded from capital bonds and some of it gets funded through appropriations. And then eventually it gets into appropriations and it's there. So actually that kind of... Um leads to a good question because um, I, th I was thinking of it from a different perspective and that is um, it's my fault because when we say the town of Scarborough sometimes I think of it as the entire town and everything's underneath it including the schools and then there's other times when I realize the town of Scarborough is really the municipal entity versus the school entity and our references over time so there's two approaches one is that we can adopt this policy understanding that probably the municipal budget and the municipal um, managers will follow this with our hope that the school department and the school managers will um, accept this maybe with some adjustments and or ask us to make some adjustments so that it becomes then a unified policy for both departments um, the question I have is and maybe this is something that can come is, is good if we can get a, an opinion and I don't know who if it's illegal um, can we impose this if the council approves this can we impose this on the school department's capital budget that we approve? Does the school have to follow the town charter, the 400000 Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah, I can. Do you see what I'm getting at with that? Because I know some people, I, 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 they're sitting on my shoulder right now, it's, it's, it's tell, and I'm not going to name names, but there's voices saying, you know, they, they will disagree with this because it's a school budget issue, even though we approve it and it doesn't go to referendum. 
they're charged with making that decision on behalf of the school department and it's outside of our purview where I look at this and say our policy should be consistent for everyone right well push comes to shove and, I, and, and the reason why I'm questioning this sorry the reason why I'm questioning this is that I'm not looking for confrontation in this process or in the budget process because we've made great strides and I don't want to create something that develops into a confrontation or into conflict my suggestion and we have shared this with uh, our colleagues on the school side uh, I think they were generally receptive to the notion um, I would say we pass it for ourselves to right. provide the leadership and strongly encourage them to comply if they're resistant and you want to push the issue once they propose the preliminary budget it is yours I think you can mix and match you can pull things out of operating mm -hmm. capital to be consistent with this policy if you wished I, I, I think that's fully within your purview that's the way the charter is designed well and one of the things that we learn um, um, from uh, the legislative conversations and when I say legislative it's the state level and that it is you know the legislature mandated they have to fund education by 55 percent and public opinion and legal opinion is that they can break their own rules whenever they want they don't need to beat it so I think that even we can do that not that I want to but um, you know I, I do think if we're going to pass something and we're going to approve it then we should follow it so I want to make sure that it's working out of the gate and doesn't create that conflict you have you have bottom line authority or the council has bottom line authority on the school's budget but do they have line item on capital I thought they had I line they item on there capital. somehow if they wish to yes so there's you know I would recommend that we approve this also and then but, it, but even provide it to the school and their finance committee maybe and yeah. work it through that I will way. say I've never dealt with a confrontation around capital um, I, the only thing I remember is several years ago when, and I think it was in their operating, it was, I'm pretty certain it was in the operating budget where the council's recommendation was to adjust the school department's budget by 500,000. And it was directly related to the implementation of all day kindergarten. And even though the council suggested that that was the area, <coughs> the school department came in and said, um, we support all day kindergarten. And we're going, they found it within the budget and they reallocated to that area. So it wasn't really a question of capital, but they can realign so even if it's not a line item my point is and we reduce their two million dollars request by a million because we don't agree with something they may sit there and say okay everything else we're going to then align and actually purchase this item that's how I understood the uh, the lot of read do you know what I'm saying with that mm -hmm. so if they had two projects at a million bucks a piece we said well we don't want to support laptops they could take the million dollars that does get approved and say we're gonna buy laptops and just ban everything else is how I understood the lottery. I think they could if they wish to do that. Right. Once you approve the, its bottom line authority, is what you right. have. How once that's done, how, they can then choose to spend it differently. Right. Even on the them. capital side. Yeah. 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 You think so? I, I I think it is. That surprises me. But that doesn't mean. Capital but, side. But, me but, too. But, yeah. Yeah. I, I could be completely wrong. I have been in the past. Um, but my point though is that for me, the policy is at least a baseline for having the conversation of what should be included in the capital budget, where we really <laughs> haven't focused a lot on that budget. And and we shouldn't sit there and, and suggest that the purpose of this policy is to deal with just the school department. This is about the town as a whole and about having one policy that hopefully will eventually work for everyone. So I don't want to over focus and concentrate on just schools. Yeah. Yeah, this is a huge, this is like moving ahead light years. I mean, just during right. my short tenure, the capital budget was kind of a, not a slush fund, but it was where things were pushed that it was a convenient way of, oh, it doesn't affect the tax rate next year. We've moved tremendously the other way, and we, we now have open discussions. We're now defining what is capital, what isn't. Yeah. Um, I think we've, we've made a lot of progress. This past year was the first year they submitted a five-year capital plan, which is a big step forward. Uh, they're behind the curve in that regard so uh, I agree I don't want it confrontational so far they've right. been receptive and I think we can be uh, we can continue down that path and hopefully it doesn't become confrontational so that's a good question for you that to a specific thing. one a couple things one on the capital equipment so you mentioned a plow truck a couple times plow trucks probably are over a hundred thousand at this point mm. yeah two or yeah. three they're about almost four now I think really four hundred four hundred thousand for a plow truck um I thought they're like 120 mm. Well, with all of the pieces, no, they're probably about 250 by the time you get oh my God. all the so, stuff together with them. So this, so you're saying we've been ex we've been putting plow trucks in operational. So this would now no, they've been in capital. Oh, we've been, been bonding capital. them every okay. year. All right, so this hundred would, what this hundred on capital equipment wouldn't do the cruisers 
or a cruiser, or you mentioned an enforcement those are, officer's car. Those were. The, uh, uh, cruisers are in operating. That's one of the things it we've is, been able it is to now. migrate over. Yep. But see, it's it's a plow truck is recurring, so, and as are the, the police vehicles. You know. So that's, what that's you're right. using the, is the if it's a, oh, a, a recurring uh, asset, it's being is migrating to the operating budget. Right. Notwithstanding that, everyone agrees it's a capital asset. Everybody would agree it's capital asset. And yes. we fund it with appropriations, with tax dollars raised in that year. <clears throat> there's also a theory of finance to keep in, in mind here. I mean, there's some that say those that use the item, whether it's a ladder truck or a newly paved street, uh, ought to be the ones paying for it, as opposed to um, hitting, you know. Four years out. Or, or, or having yeah. someone this in one year pay for all of it. Right. But it's going to be in service for 25 years. That's where I agree. Right. So you're arguing that it should be capitalized. Right. Certain items, uh, I think there, there's a strong theory of those who, who have the benefit of use should be the ones paying for it, as opposed to saving money and buying it by cash, with cash. So, the, so, so to get a, to Council Dive, he said capital improvement projects we have major non reoccurring. But we don't specify under capital equipment. We just have a major expenditure. Yeah, kind so, of the so we're not drawing a line between. So that the way this is worded wouldn't allow a plow truck to go into operational. It would probably based. stay in capital based on that. Right. But, but over a 20-year, 15-year period, or 10-year, however long we would finance it, if we buy a plow truck every every year for 10 years, and we finance those plow trucks every year for 10 years then we're paying interest on each of those plow trucks over a 10-year period every year. So every year we're just paying interest on something that's really operating because we're buying it every year. Right. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. Where the interest is just compounding over that 10-year period for each of those trucks. Mm. Yeah. yeah. And people are, even if it's allocated in the operating budget and not through finances, people are still paying for it over years because I've never seen my tax rate go down after the capital expenditure went up in oh, one wait. year. So you're still paying for the increase over time for that, expen for that expenditure. And, and to me, the goal of this is to try and keep our bonding projects for the really major items, which a plow truck at 260000 is a pretty major item. Right. But since we're doing it every year, yeah, but, see, I don't. but but you know, if we are trying to build a twenty million dollar, thirty nine million dollar school or whatever it is, we currently are hitting bond limits, self imposed, admittedly, but we're hitting bond limits that you know we're trying to save those bond proceeds for these mm -hmm. major items. Mm -hmm. So there's lots of. We can take some more time to think about this. I mean, I, so long as we have something solidly in place in time for budget is really the yeah. target. We can try and incorporate some of the things we've talked about in here, too, based yeah. on limits and things. Um, I'm not sure how the committee feels, but I would actually recommend moving this forward because I think that as part of the uh, discussion at the council level, we'll get um, obviously a majority of the council involved in that decision, first of all. Secondarily, um, I do recommend that at least the insertion of that word total be amended um, on the capital improvements project definition mm -hmm. so that that's clear. I'm comfortable at least for discussion purposes at the $100,000 level in those blank spaces because it's consistent with the levels that are over there. Um, even though I said previously there might be too low, but I think that that is a good benchmark to begin that discussion. Now, if this goes to the council, will there be a public hearing on this? No it's a policy? Probably not. No, yeah, so it's just a... And you take public comment, there's no published public hearing, per se. Okay. Um, so, the, so the question I have to the committee members is, where, um, how do you want to move forward? What would you like to do on this? Well, I'm, I'm just, I just had one more question about what Ruth said with, uh, if you have a, a, a repetitive recurring uh, capital expense that if you, uh, expense it rather than uh, uh, capitalize it. You are avoiding the interest payments. But you have to get over the hump of... Appropriating it. Uh, of the initial appropriation, which is kind of up here. Mm -hmm. And then at some point, it, it 
it goes back down rapidly, but then you're, because you have to build in that uh, yearly recurring plow truck. Uh, but it's, it just doesn't have anything to do with capital costs. It, that's, I mean, I, I mean, it, our, I don't know if it's helpful. It, it's almost like is, it's. I mean, I agree with the idea of if you can buy it outright, and and not and not borrow, not be a borrower. That's that's better, a better way to do it. But because of the useful life, because of the large dollar amounts, we're only doing it for those items that are repetitive. Mm -hmm. We wouldn't do it for any other capital items. Right. Right. We're only gravitating over to the expense side of the equation on those items that, like school buses, like police vehicles. And, and that actually kind of goes to like the uh, page four, the reserve funds at the bottom. It talks about creating a contingency yeah. reserve, yeah. which would help. I like that. Which would help that, <laughs> yeah. I think, yeah. in, the, in the future. I, don't know. I, mean, I, I guess I have two questions. It's just one, I just think. I'm a little troubled that I, I can look back and have a conversation, but I think if we have a capitalization policy, we need to follow it. Yeah, I don't think you can have sort of a gray area of saying, well, these things are capital or not capital based on other criteria that we don't identify. So I just think the purpose of having a policy is to articulate what you're going to do. Mm -hmm. We're having a plow truck. We're, we're, we're having some confusion about whether that's a capital item or an operating item. So I think whatever we put here, should make it clear where that goes. So we don't do it one way one right. year and another way another year. So, sorry. So however, however we get there. Then the second thing, and I just use this as an example not to create controversy, but we did have some questions about every year, and I'm just using this as an example, where every year the school systems have what they call their tech refresh, which has been about a million and a half dollars. And some of that, so how do we, how do we define whether a tech refresh is a capital item, or again, if we do it every year and they're reinvesting in just upgrades to software and that type of thing, is that an operational expense? So I think those are two good examples mm -hmm. of where whatever verbiage we put in here really helps define where those should, should go. And, and that, no, to, but to add, because that's, it gets to the question of when I ask for an opinion, is whether or not we can then, if, we, if there is disagreement in that definition with the school department, which rule trumps? You know, which one do we go by? Because they could sit there and say their opinion is you only have bottom, even on the capital budget, you have bottom line authority. Mm -hmm. So if they put in the tech refresh into the capital budget and we say, well, we, we do not approve it because it does not follow our policy, if they have enough money still in that capital budget, can they sit there and say we're going to now spend that on the, cap on the tech refresh? And supersede. A school bus. Do you see what I'm saying? So th that goes into the question I asked about okay. getting an opinion about. But I think if you're if who's the, in control, I guess, or or whose policy. Trumps. If you if you say it comes out of capital, the theory will be that you're going to fund it somehow in operating, not just take it out and say, okay, now you got to fund it however you want. So somehow that the funding piece has to move with the appropriation request. So I think if you move the money over to operating right. as long, you know, I don't think they'd have an issue. I, I don't either, I don't but know, the but question I have is do we have that authority to tell them you have to take it out of capital and put it into the operating? I just need that yeah. one question. I'm sure that, you know what I'm saying? Do we have uh, that authority may to have that? one interpretation there, may have another, have another one. that doesn't, yeah. that doesn't <laughs> negate the importance of this for us. Yeah. Uh, and I know they have their own attorney, able... and you can't get two attorneys yeah. to agree right. exactly the same. So we don't, Unless they're on the same case. We may not know a definitive answer to that, frankly. Right. That's not to say we shouldn't be doing this for our own purposes right. anyway. And that's yeah. how I'm kind of walking into it, but I think that would be a good question to ask. And, you know, I, I, we reach out to the school department. It's not like we're trying to create something bad. I mean, if we can get um, an opinion from the superintendent who will probably get an opinion from their attorney, maybe they're both the same and says, yes, you, you as a town council can say we're not going to fund it through up through the capital budget, we want it funded and operating, and we have the authority to reallocate it into that. I, I, I question whether we do because we only have that bottom. Well, of course we could. We have the bottom line, and we can increase it. Well, Imagine the headlines with that. Town Council increases their budget 12%. Yeah, but then they can do what they want after you approve the amount. Uh, 
more than likely what will happen if the, when this policy goes in place, it will add great clarity to 90% of the items. There will be a handful, and I think we've touched on two or three that we know in our, in our minds. There might be one or two others, not an infinite number. And those could be conversation pieces. I mean, I could flag those uh, as part of what the Finance Committee can do, just to, once we actually have tangible things in front of us and understand our spending habits. Mm -hmm. um, so I think we need we, to get in place and have some experience. Yeah. If it's um, if it behooves the, if we move this forward after today, um, maybe the two things that could accompany this when it goes to the council is the fact sheet that has these questions that we're asking, you know, um, and have the answer, so that we can then share it with our colleagues, um, as well as the public. You know, ask the question about the legal authority of reallocating. Um, ask the questions about you know that we were talking about with the dollar value issue type of thing. Have that in kind of the Q and A piece or fact sheet. Um, the other piece that I wanted to ask, if we do move this forward, um, and I'm in favor of moving it forward, mm -hmm. um, I would like to know the impact of this if it was implemented a year ago. So if you can take a look at last year's budget and say, if we had implemented this, what is the, it helps to understand all of this language and qualitative statements with factual numbers and say, the operating budget would have increased X dollars as a result, rather than the, you know, being financed. Yeah. And I don't need details. I, uh, uh, hey, if you came back with one statement that says it would have increased 1.2 million and would have resulted in the tax rate increasing another 10 cents, to me is a very valuable statement. I don't need to have the details of each of the projects. I just need to know, for me, I don't know if anybody else wants the detail, but. The that's, one thing, good, that's a good I question. Mean, that, that would help. It gives reality to the reality to how it works. <clears throat> uh, Ruth, is the reserve fund of the section on page to the bottom of page four and it, top of five actually oh uh, yeah i guess I'm, I'm looking at the prior draft uh top of five <laughs> is that uh a fund balance provision what what is that saying we're we're, we're doing is that just the aspirational that came out of the debt management policy I think so. Um, it's it's not fund balance from the point of view that fund balance is an operational. It's to unspent funds. It's, I think it's going. It's essentially becomes a, like a rainy day fund to help us during either something catastrophic that happens or, or recessionary things where you know well, there have been times during the year where. So I would why go do we need it if we have a fund balance uh, policy? Well, I think this works in conjunction with the fund balance policy. It actually might be in the fund balance policy. I think it policy. is. I think that's the purpose There's of it being there along with the charter because you notice that they're both together. Yeah. There are references to other policies, not necessarily it, a creation of a new policy. Maybe we need to reduce it to writing, but I view there's priority of policies. Fund balance is supreme, that we yeah. need to meet those totally requirements. And then that policy goes on to describe if you exceed these upper limits yeah. of fund balance, what do you do with that money? Well, one Some of those of things you do to. is you start to establish and fund these reserve accounts, but you don't do that until you've met your, your standards. In so this account. is once you've met your 8.3 percent. It's actually the upper side of that. It's 8.3, it? and if you get above 10, above 10, yeah. you start I think it is. It. Then you can start to fund these, the equipment okay. reserve okay. and the reserve. Yeah, funds. I didn't know the connection. That's why I asked yeah. the question. Well, but I guess yeah, I guess I'm confused because when I read this, I thought we were trying to create a reserve. For capital items for a rainy day fund so that if we had didn't think we need a new plow truck and something happened we needed a new plow truck that there were some capital reserves available not to be used generally it would be used at the council's you know discretion but the, the but is, is that his, peter's point is it's a capital right or that's my question yeah I, I, that's not clear. the yeah. question is where does it how's it funded i mean uh, yeah well you, you you could each year you could appropriate Fund money appropriations to, but was that the intent that it that it would be this? So this reserve wasn't intended to be capital. No, it says both capital and operating during okay. revenue short months. The equipment okay. reserve fund on page five, without debt financing, that one is specific to equipment. Yeah. I mean, short of funding it with annual appropriations, which is something we've never done. Right. Um, the way it would be funded is if our fund balance gets above 
then that policy says the money Put it flows here. into these accounts. I see. Okay. Does this really belong in a capital uh, capital planning policy? We're trying to be thorough in covering all the pieces that touch this, like the charter has a provision that has an effect. Um, these reserve funds look back to the debt management policy and the fund balance policy. So we're just trying to make sure we had some cross-referencing going on. Could I suggest that we change the title of that last section starting on page four? Uh, rather than financing options for capital budgets, which kind of uh, yeah, could lead the reader to think that this is new, mm -hmm. is to maybe um, change that to affiliated policies um, in support of this policy or affiliated, you know, I, can, I can't think of the language at the moment, but you know, something, because this, we're referencing existing charter and existing policies. Yeah. There's no change. These are references. Yeah, right. That's so I would take a recommendation from the manager and the director. It would, wouldn't bother me. Yeah. The only other thing I just, well, maybe it's in here and I've just missed it, is usually we put something in here that re, re reviews them after a period of time. I'm not sure that we have uh, it in here. I thought there was one yeah. year. Is it here? Yeah, you're reviewing it. Yeah, when you're reviewing it. This policy will be enforced. Implementation. Uh, yeah. It will be reviewed by the finance director and manager and the committee at least annually. Yeah. Do we want it to be annually or do we want it to be like every, I was going to say three years because, you know, you get one year in and then two years, whatever. We can go back and change it, right? So yeah. I'd say. Sure. Especially year. with some of the conversations <laughs> we've had today about. Yeah, yeah I think we need some experience and okay. you know, to modify it. So, for the purpose, of, okay. when, when just one. I'm sorry. On just just the language around the town charter piece. Is mm -hmm. that beyond the preview of this to just get clarity about what items? I mean, I, I go back to the laptops and whether that was a single purchase or several purchases. Do we need some clarifying language? Is it that it's town charter? So that that's outside of the scope of this. It is. Okay. And it's untouchable. Uh, okay. It can only be changed Almost. through a charter commission, charter commission. Yeah. recommended Good. to the council, and then ultimately by the voters. So yeah. what we found ourselves is having to interpret what the voters mm -hmm. intended. Right. Or what was put in front of them and they and voted on it. And there's some interpretations. There are is. Different on that. That's there okay. Is. And there have been multiple charter commissions right. formed through the years that have dug into this and in the end have done, not done much. Uh, to Sean's point of the 400,000, that is a bit of an outdated number, given the size of our, our organization. One way around that is to assign a percentage of operating, so it climbs mm -hmm. as your organization grows, mm -hmm. so it's I, not static. I tried to do research on that. I don't believe that number has ever changed since the charter was approved when we went from a town meeting. 1969. 1969. So that number is extremely outdated. Um, I do know that the charter commissions, at least the two that I've lived through, over the 20 year period, last 20 years, I believe the last one got the closest. They recommended a million dollars, um, which I'm more in line with, and it failed, I think, at the committee level by one. I think you're right. By one vote. If I, for some reason, it just sticks out of my head because I think it's a big. Although, I'll be honest, um, while I want the charter to change a million dollars, I think there should be an auxiliary question, and that is that the total bonds in a given year. If it exceeds X, should go to the voters. So while you can increase that 400 to a million, just so that you avoid this conflict of, well, okay, you're going to have 600 here, 600 here, then the total vote should actually. So uh, uh, that's a different conversation, right? So I would, um, I would move to recommend that the finance committee recommend to the town council this new capital budget policy, um, with the following uh, notations or amendments, friendly amendments. That on page two under capital improvement project we insert the word total in between in the first sentence in between non reoccurring non reoccurring expenditure so it'd be non reoccurring total expenditure and then we change the amount at the end of that sentence to estimated costs in excess of a hundred thousand as well as in the next definition under capital equipment uh, with estimated costs in excess of a hundred thousand as well and then um, lastly to, uh, to, to the discretion of maybe the town manager and the director to change the title on page four of the financing options for capital budgets to reflect that these are affiliated or affiliated uh, policy references. Affiliated policy references, uh, policy and charter, because charter is not policy. Mm -hmm. but whatever the appropriate title is for that, I'd be happy with. I don't think it's too material as long as it's clear. Um, 
any other adjustments or changes anybody would like to recommend? We'll do it as one kind of motion. I guess the only other one was just to get clarity around the capital equipment. I was going to try and improve the definition. The definition gets a little clearer about yep. that, that tries to address whether it's operational capital. Excellent. So I know motion's pending. I, I'm, I'm wondering if we're going to have time to do these other things, prepare a fact sheet, and do this kind of look back to what impact would this policy have on the most recently approved budget uh, before agree. next Wednesday. I mean, in fact, I'm going to get done by shoot for Friday this week. The first meeting in November, we're still the still the council, still the same council. Okay. So. That's fine. Hey, I just wanted to, to I mean, be clear. Yeah, I, don't I mean, this is that yeah. I'm, I'm fine with that. Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And I'd like to get it done because we've been working on it. But I'm if it takes longer, it takes longer. I can't get everything done overnight. Well, it's not bad. Uh, even if it expands into the new finance committee, it's not bad to give them something that's 95 percent done, so mm -hmm. they can have early success too. You hope. So do you want, to, you want to vote on that combo of of uh, edits? Yes. Uh, uh, I'll second it. Okay. Any other comments? The, the only thing I, um, for me, the, the key to the passing this is if um, it's getting kind of those questions answered from um, that we talked about earlier. The, the big piece is the, the definition on the capital equipment that Peter mentioned, but really it's the about the capital improvements budgets for the school department, which. We do approve and doesn't go to referendum. I need to know how this impacts so I can understand the relationship with the school department on this issue. What? Any, no, anything, else. anything else, Peter? No? Okay. okay. Um, motion made, seconded. All in favor with the amendments? Great. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, the next item um, is on our agenda. However, um, I have to apologize. Um, I'll take responsibility. I've attempted to contact our friends on the school board's finance committee over the last several weeks and schedules are just not convenient at the particular time. So um, we have not had a joint, uh, we were hoping to have a joint session with them to review the proposal. And so um, I would actually like to remove this uh, from our agenda at the time. Um, and I'm happy with the work that we've done, but um, I'm not going to, I personally um, am not going to advance this topic at this time because we're not prepared to do that. Um, and because um, I really wanted to do this uh, jointly with them and we're not there yet. So apologize for not getting the work done a little quicker. Um, maybe next time if I'm uh, on finance. Unless, I mean, I'm only one person on a three-person committee unless, I, I don't know how you guys feel about it. Uh, I've always thought that it, would, it should be a joint effort together so that we're not um, bringing them to the table where they're reluctant to do so. Uh, that I wanted it to be a positive experience. Yeah. Uh, I like the idea of it, or most of it. Yeah. Uh, it might go beyond, uh, uh, in some respects, <clears throat> given how many good things I thought were contributed to last year's uh, process, but uh, uh, you're, you're the chair who's been talking to the Finance Committee of the School Board, so you know where they're at. And, and I will mention, I have talked to, even though we didn't meet jointly, I did reach out to all three members of the Finance Committee, and so um, we're kind of, uh, what's the word? We're in this kind of juggling match of trying to figure out dates and trying to kind of get this consensus, and it's just, um, uh, I'm done juggling. <laughs> and I, I just don't think it's uh, fruitful, and there's a time to cut it off, and I think this is the time. Well, I, uh, it doesn't mean that the thing should just be dropped. Right. Yep. Uh, I think that uh, we're all here come November, the third Wednesday in November. So, uh, um, so you know, unless you have any, uh, just to add to that, I completely agree. Um, no matter which seat I sit in, I want to make sure that I see that through. I will suggest, though, is that. Um, my own personal style is that I don't have a lot of time to talk about what's old. I really want to look at what's going to be new. So I hope that when this is brought back up, we're talking about the new budget cycle and about how we can use at least our experiences uh, to make that better. Um, I really wanted this lessons learned exercise um, so that it was um, kind of that transition from one year to the next. It's not going to necessarily happen as smoothly as I wanted, but I think that with the commitment of the school board, which I, I'm sure that we'll get, 
it needs to be part of at least the discussion when we get started with the budget next year. <clears throat> can can we ask the town manager to uh, indicate are there elements of what is in this proposal that the school with that we're going to go forward no matter what? I mean, in terms of yeah, I would strongly recommend, and I'm not sure if we need to go through this formal process, but kind of a post-mortem, just a, a conversation, what worked, what didn't. I'll need that direction fairly early. You know, there's a couple of new things we brought on that, from my perspective, work quite well. The joint presentation <coughs> between myself and the superintendent to start off the process. The budget forum was, again, something new last year that um, I'd like some feedback whether that's we should do it. Um, beyond that, Staff, uh, you know, has talked about some process improvements that, that we're actually moving forward on um, in terms of budget formats and uh, portals of information to make sure that there's one-stop shopping for people that are interested. Mm -hmm. um, information, yeah. Those are really just kind of internal, more administrative things that we think will vastly improve. Uh, we don't necessarily need the committee to, to direct us to do so, but we can have a conversation about it. But I think that, um, to that point, I think that... Um, First of all, uh, not to be too blunt, I hope that at least a good portion of the sitting committee remains on the committee because we've done very, I think we've done very well this year. And I hope obviously um, one of the three of us is chair so that there is some continuity as well because, uh, you know, um, it helps. And I would hope that maybe the first meeting of the new finance committee, maybe that's the appropriate conversation because it sets the pace and sets the uh, foundation for getting started because I remember when I got elected uh, in the very first meeting, um, I was told I was chair of finance and we started immediately. So there isn't a whole lot of time to get on the ground and running. You have to really kind of be ready. And so I think that maybe I, I totally agree because I'd love to hear and we've talked personally, we've talked. So I'd love to have a formal report from management, which includes the school department about things that they're mm -hmm. recommending that we continue maybe things that we absolutely did right that we can continue that's easy for them to do the things that were challenging mm -hmm. um, and they want direction on and the things that they may say that didn't work because of their own um, experience so I think that's a maybe a good way to get started on the new finance committee in November or December <clears throat> I just want to Sean whether if it's if it's not going to work out timing wise and schedule wise for the whole group to get together whether even it'd be useful at one of our meetings just to kind of do that sort of 3,000 mile high view about what worked, what didn't work, just some mm -hmm. parting suggestions for improving the process for next year. So when you from, say from for our, our meeting, you're talking about the council? Oh, no, the finance committee. Just, just so the, if you look at our schedule, this is our last meeting before the new council sits. Isn't that correct? Was, uh, the new council takes their seat uh, November 17th, I think, is the date. So I think you're right. Your, meet, your meeting wouldn't occur until maybe that same week, for all I know. Actually, yeah. I know Council Chair Holbrook mentioned a kind of a goal-setting yeah. um, workshop. Yeah. Maybe the full council could be engaged, at least for them to have, as a full council who yeah. lived through uh, <laughs> that process, uh, that conversation could happen at that point. When did she propose that for? She made mention at the last council meeting, I thought, or maybe she mentioned our workshop, like before the, uh, yeah. the council meeting. So it has to be either this one or the next the one. The right? November fourth meeting, meeting she asked. So I would be in favor of that. Uh, I mean, the idea of batting it around. The three of the us learnings. have lived it. Town manager, uh, uh, finance director, been very much in the middle of of how we have tried to <clears throat> advance uh, it and. Uh, any, any workshop setting certainly can uh, can have finance committee members from the uh, school board participate. Yeah. Uh, it's um, an informal setting. Just, throw just, there. just keep in mind, so uh, and I fall into this category, we all love to talk, and we only have an hour, yeah. and we can't have the only conversation about finance, because we spent 10 months on the budget. Um, that's not the only thing that we do around here, right? Um, so well, I don't disagree with having it. I'm just true. saying this is kind of a bad time, and that's why I'm kind of stop. I'm, I'm going to stop chasing my tail trying to get it done because two weeks we have elections. Right. Things are kind of you know up in the air for that two weeks, and 
I don't want to give up on it, but I'm not going to chase my tail anymore either. So. And goal setting isn't just this. Well, uh, You're right. Yeah, and it's actually, I don't think uh, Ms. Holbrook's, uh, it's about goal setting. It's about the review of what we set for goals. That's what I meant. Yeah. yeah. We're looking at a lot more than just how did we do in the yeah. budget process. Okay. So, so um, let's think about whether we want another meeting in November. I, it sounds like we could if we needed to, because I was thinking for some reason it was a week earlier than the 17th. But we could if we needed to, um, and maybe that's the that's the sole thing that we have to talk about. Yeah. Uh, and given the time frame, maybe I have enough time to get to the school board members and see if they do want to maybe meet on that other proposal issue. It could be at least a carryover into the next. You know, one of the recommendations yeah. to the next finance committee is that we move that forward, not to give up chasing my tail. Close. It's kind of like the picture. Of, did you see the picture of the dog on the internet? He caught his tail and he goes, "Now what do I do with it?" <laughs> I feel like I'm kind of like that dog chasing my tail. What do I do with it now? <laughs> so um, I only hope, to the extent that I can influence you, Tom, in your, in your narrative around the budget process, um, and this is, kind of goes into the closing comments piece for everyone, I want to say thank you for all that you did this year. The qualitative approach that we took in this budget is probably the greatest success that I've seen in the 15 years I've been around. Great. I think it's extremely more meaningful than simply going through a budget line by line questioning why did this jump up 300% when we're talking about going from 500 to 1500, you know, uh, $1,500. It just never, the first year is kind of a nice um, acumen and getting kind of, uh, you kind of understand what goes on, but doing it year after year after year after year. And so um, to the extent that I'm so proud of it is um, for the people to know is that I've, uh, what is it, the greatest form of flattery is plagiarism. Um, but I'm not plagiarizing because I'm giving full credit because serving on the county budget, I'm actually taking our budget process and that qualitative document and recommending it to the county that they use that in their presentation of their budget so that it's more meaningful for us at that level on county services. So whether they use it or not or, you know, do some type of uh, um, a composition of it, I think uh, will speak volumes to how we lead in the in the regional aspect. So I just want to say thanks to you, Tom and Thank Ruth, you. and everybody, yes. all the managers. Um, you know, my, my last comment, I guess, is I, I want to thank the two of you as well, very much, um, serving um, as chair. Um, you know, at first I was like, geez, you know, things have kind of fallen in the last month, fallen through the, cr uh, the, the cracks. You know, we didn't get everything done that we wanted. Um, but if you think about it, we actually got a lot done. I mean, that qualitative process of the budget was significant. The public forum was a significant move. It wasn't perfect, but nothing is perfect in government. Mm -hmm. um, we can improve it. We will improve it going forward. We're all going to be part of that process mm -hmm. next year, as well as uh, Councilor <coughs> Katarina's here. Um, and so we're going to all be um, inputters into that process, along with our new councilors that come on. Um, so, you know, we're, we are moving forward, and I do think that we moved the gauge forward. And that was my goal at the beginning of the year, and I want to thank both of you for helping do that significantly. Um, and then really, I, I really want to say thank you to the community. Um, the budget process in itself was extremely painful, only in the sense that um, we went through this um, laborious process and we had the same five people show up at every meeting, although they're welcome. You kind of have to ask, you know, why only five people show up? And then we're crucified when we make the decisions about taxes. Um, so I hope that if anything we learned is that we need more participation. And I welcome all of that, no matter what level I participate in. But um, with that, I'll turn it. Any closing comments for the committee or well, me, the one I, you I must say, I, I, I was frustrated uh, uh, by uh, the um, timing of events. I thought uh, uh, losing uh, uh, so much revenue from the state and then getting a uh, substantial portion of it back uh, whipsawed us terribly on uh, the referendum votes. Uh, um, um, uh, on process, however, I thought your know, leadership was exemplary and I really appreciated that. That was not something that I personally think I could have ever accomplished. So I was, I admired it very much. So. Uh, in that respect, I think we're going in the right direction in terms of improving the process. I thought the town manager's effort to get his department heads to uh, present us with more readable budgets. Uh, and again, I find it very difficult to just look at just sheets of numbers and, and try and fathom what, uh, what should be understood about it. So uh, for me, that was a much better experience than the year before. So. My comments. Mm -hmm.
and, and I guess I just echo pretty much what everything has been said. Thank you for your leadership in trying to move us to a different place, a different process. Really do appreciate the amount of work that goes into preparing the budgets, answering questions, doing all that. I still have volumes of stuff on my desk. Um, I have not been through the budget process before. I really appreciated the, the, the format that we had for the, for the municipal budget. I'll echo what Council Donovan said. It was really easy to look at that and try to figure out what's going on, where the appropriate <clears throat> questions were. Mm -hmm. um, I was really impressed by all of your managers that came forward. Um, they were very, we asked questions. Some of them were probably stupid questions, but they didn't make us feel stupid. Mm -hmm. They, I felt like they just answered with tremendous integrity and frankness and tremendous leadership because at the end of the day when we needed more money, they went back to the drawing board and came up. So that's tremendous leadership across the board. So very true. Thank you. Um, it was a little more stressful than I would have liked. So I, I hope part of the process as we talk about coming years, we can find ways to do it better and agree to disagree civilly and move us to a better place. So. You know, actually, two things to remind me. Uh, first of all, you know, um, I'm in a unique situation because I've had to leave twice on the council for work purposes and then come back. And, you know, one of the things I've always said is that you're not a true Mainer until you've moved away and then really wanted to come back. And I've been able to do that, and I'm really happy of being back. And I think about how great Scarborough is because if you look at our neighboring communities, some of them are really struggling um, with their operations from a um, community perspective. I mean, you think about without naming names, but everybody will know once they, you know, they're losing assistant town city managers, they're losing public works directors, they're losing fire chiefs. Um, there's a lot of people that are becoming unengaged that have a lot of experience. And then we have a very dedicated workforce across the board, including in our schools. And that is where the true value of Scarborough comes. And we get to see it every day. And, and sometimes we get uh, lost because there's so much work to do that we're not an, out there enough to kind of really kind of uh, praise that. and. Uh, when I went up to the Maine Municipal Association's convention and saw how our chief of police was honored mm -hmm. as chief of the year, and he talked about how fire chief, sorry, the fire chief, um, uh, Chief Thurlow, uh, as chief of the year, he talked from his heart and got a little choked up, and he talked about how Scarborough truly is a big family. And that's why we do what we do. So I think it's uh, very important to also kind of um, throw a, a handshake out there to our school board mates as part of that family because they were part of the big change as yes. well. They um, uh, really stepped forward, and I, I really want to express my appreciation to uh, Chairwoman Beely, um, Christine Messingill, and then Chris Siazzo because they were the, um, the big part of us getting together and working together and hopefully at least setting the framework for next year to take it to the next level. So um, yes, I at least want, I wanted to really say thank you to them. Just remember, all big families, good families, are somewhat dysfunctional. Uh, yeah, absolutely. So it comes to the Do not talk about my dysfunctional family in front of me. <laughs> <laughs> I will defend it to the end. So uh, with that, uh, if there's a motion to adjourn. So, all in favor? Okay. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.